My name is Janati Stolyarov II. I'm the chairman of the United States Transhumanist Party, which seeks to put science, health, and technology at the forefront of politics. Our first core ideal is the pursuit of significant life extension through science and technology. And I'm also the author of this book, which is Death is Wrong, the children's book on indefinite human life extension, an illustrated children's book that tries to get more people to become scientists, technologists, innovators like Edouard, uh, like Alejandro, like Harold, like the people we're speaking with here today. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll follow. Uh, uh, my name is Ben Zion. I'm the vice chair of the United States Transhumanist Party, the aforementioned uh, organization and presidential candidate uh, for 2020 for that organization. And I too am a, a life extension advocate and organizer. And a universal super longevity is the nearest and dearest of things to my heart. And uh, I, I value so much uh, the research and work of folks on this call. And I hope uh, to uh, do what little I can uh, to contribute to uh, this and other strategies, including those in public policy uh, to uh, achieving that outcome. Impressive, and happy to see you. Yes, it's good to see uh, you. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Bobby Ridge, and uh, um, so I have a bachelor's in biomedical science, and I have a YouTube channel called Life Extension Research. Um, a lot of others have YouTube channels on here, so it's really great to have all of you on. And uh, you know, I really look forward to helping lifeexcel.com just as much as possible. And you know, I plan on being at the forefront of uh, you know, manufacturing life extension treatments, uh, uh, cell and gene therapies and supplements, and foods, and, uh, and you know, just trying to make as much money as fast as possible in this sphere so that I can fund this t uh, science so that we can extend our lifespans um, to th for thousands of years. Um, yeah. All right. <clears throat> Antti, perhaps? A small introduction. Uh, yes, so I'm Antti Peltonen from Finland, uh, and I've been uh, kind of a longevity advocate for quite a, some time, kind of a, a very close relations with uh, Ilya, Ilya Stampler. And I'm working in a microfabrication uh, area on the uh, Auto University as a process engineer. So I have a quite a good access to all kind of a, uh, tools uh, to analysis, microscopy, fabrication, things like that. Excellent. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Steel Archer. I'm the host of Debt Nation, uh, where we're busy putting death out of business, big advocate of the US Transhumanist Party, big advocate of everyone in this room and life extension in general. And, you know, we're always going to be there to... Uh, promote life extension and to put life extension at the forefront of uh, the general, you know, the, the general public, uh, you know, promote life extension in a way that gets the general public excited about uh, and acclimated to the notion of, of general life extension of humans, uh, you know, of humans. So yeah, absolutely fantastic to have this meeting here today. Uh, very excited to have this meeting and uh, I look forward to hearing the views of everyone in this room. Thank you very much. So happy to meet you all. And so I know most of you already uh, through many exchanges, but we don't have the chance to see each other very often. Uh, so my name is Edouard Bordeaux-Bonneuil. I live in France. Um, and I have been in the field like most of you for a long time, maybe 20 years. Um, and uh, well, I, I'm a good scientist, uh, but also a good statistician. And so uh, uh, I did a lot of data analysis uh, through health databases, um, and I wanted to see if, for example, people who take uh, uh, rapamycin uh, then uh, have uh, lower risks of uh, aging-related diseases. Uh, the trouble is that people who take rapamycin, they have cancer also at the same time, so it becomes difficult to disentangle the different effects. Uh, you can do the same with metformin. The trouble is that they, they have uh, diabetes. Uh, so ideally, uh, we should have people who are healthy and take uh, metformin or who and take uh, rapamycin. And this database does not exist. Um, 
also at the same time, uh, you know that uh, doing sport is good for you. Uh, it's difficult to find a database with sport uh, or physical activity and health because the two fields are not together. So you don't have the database with the same persons. You don't know if uh, the ones who have the disease are the ones who do sport or not. So of course, there are lots of uh, epidemiologic uh, studies and I have been in the field for a long time. Uh, but clearly, we don't have this uh, data set to know if it works. Um, and uh, so well, I thought maybe we can do it. Uh, so this is not a new idea. This is very basic. Um, and uh, it's also, uh, uh, there's another angle to it. A lot of people have been starting to do the famous N equals one experiment. Uh, it has become famous. So as you know, in, in science, uh, you, you do N equals five or 10. You need to have uh, to repeat the experiment that it's true. You make statistics. And a lot of people have been saying, well, that's not completely true because myself, N equals one, for example, um, uh, I, I'm fine. And suddenly I touch, I touch something very warm, hot, and it, and it hurts. So, oh, there's something. And you can repeat it so, with yourself. And, and you see, oh, yes, it, it does something, right? Um, and so hopefully the, the, we hope not to see bad effects only, but also good effects, which is a bit more difficult to detect, certainly. Uh, so you, you need biomarkers for that. And so a lot of people have started to uh, look at biomarkers. So uh, I have combined everything of that uh, together with uh, Harold, who cannot uh, be seen today. So we are um, here. And I, I should say about me, um, so I'm not only in this field of data analysis of health, I'm like you, uh, life extension advocate. Uh, what I mean this to me, it's very basic. It's like uh, doing physical activity, eating fruits and vegetables. Uh, other steps will be to take specific drugs, the ones that we mentioned, for example, uh, maybe one day gene therapies, but it's not necessarily crazy. It's just like uh, eating fruits and vegetables. Uh, it's just that we, we age and uh, there are things to do to counteract this uh, process. Um, so um, we, well, we, we looked and we knew already uh, at what people are doing when they do their N equals one experiment and we assembled everything in, in a website. Uh, so in this website, basically, uh, there are questionnaires uh, to know your health conditions. Um, there are uh, interventions uh, like uh, physical exercise or like uh, fruits and, and vegetables or better things. Um, and uh, we see uh, there are biomarkers. So we see if over time, uh, before, during, and after an intervention, things improve. The reason why we ask for health conditions is that, uh, for example, uh, if you have COVID, uh, you are in a worse state than if you don't, right? Uh, so you can take the supplements, but uh, you need to know that you have COVID or not. Otherwise, you compare apples and bananas. Um, uh, I, I just want to quickly summarize for the viewers. Uh, um, also, uh, well, my, my you know, I, I just kind of just met Edward, uh, and um, I feel like I have a pretty good understanding of what it is uh, of Life Excel. And let me know if this is correct, Edward. So, I mean, you're doing a lot over there, but one of the main things you want to do is you want to democratize and demonetize human clinical trials because human exactly. clinical trials are very expensive, and you but you're you're taking an approach. It's, it's, it's sort of similar to Human Longevity Incorporation, but you're taking the approach to where you want to not only treat, you'll not only get biomarkers in like, you know, different health statistics from healthy people, but also unhealthy people and also people taking, you know, healthy or unhealthy people taking these promising gerald protectors that can extend people's lifespan to like 150 years old, uh, potentially. So, um, and then we will compare them with people. So it, it, instead of having some $3 billion dollar, you know, like clinical trial um, that, you know, only tests on like 3,000 people, you, you could be testing on like a million people and it's like half the price of that. Is exactly. that true? So uh, indeed, I'm hoping to have a new sort of uh, clinical trial approach. So it happens that with my data analysis, I have uh, developed a drug uh, discovery company. Uh, we are now uh, starting, we have started one year ago, uh, development against Alzheimer's. Uh, my hope was not to do just development against Alzheimer's, but against aging, because I thought this compound uh, is great for many things. 
uh, but together in the existing system, it's uh, almost impossible to do a, a test against aging. Um, so it's against Alzheimer's. Um, and uh, it's being done in several phases, as you know, as you know clinical trial phases, um, in very specific centers. You need a very long process until you see the end of the, the tunnel. It's a lot of money. Um, it's very bu bureaucratic, uh, which is all good, but not that good at the same time, of course. Um, and so uh, what if we could do it the reverse way? Uh, you, your clinical trial, instead of doing in a it in a specific center, uh, you would distribute it at home over the, over the web, uh, over the internet. People will be uh, along with their medical doctors. So it's not as if they were alone. Uh, they, they are still being supervised. Um, and uh, you can uh, rapidly get a very large number of people who are interested uh, to participate. Um, and you, you have, I would say, the, the people taking the drug before waiting for the approval because it's during the test process. So it may look uh, unethical because today we wait for the approval, yeah. but it's and, exactly and the And you really, um, you really mm -hmm. don't want to be testing on Alzheimer's only, right? You want to be testing on aging. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we want to cure uh, aging and we want to treat and prevent aging. I mean, uh, so how about uh, for like be our beginner viewers, how about everybody kind of like give a, a quick like sort of um, – overview like a, a quick definition of what life extension is uh, not just on a, on a biological level but even on a societal level you know I'm sure Janati and Ben can give a really good definition of a societal level and so how about we all kind of go around and and discuss like you know what, what do we even mean by life extension like do we are we just some crazy people talking to each other like oh we're gonna live to 200 years old or is this really a thing is there real actual evidence for this uh, does anybody want to start sure uh, so I will simply say life extension has to mean youthful life extension. So it can't just mean living longer in a frail state because that is by definition impossible. It is that frail senescent state that renders one more susceptible to death by means of various diseases. So the only way to extend lifespan beyond the current empirical maximum of about 122 years is to reverse biological aging to become more youthful and therefore not experience as much susceptibility to the diseases of old age. So that is my view of life extension. It is not invulnerability. It is just being as resistant to disease as a young person is today. Yes. <clears throat> Um, I'll continue that notion with uh, uh, saying that uh, it, is, uh, it is true what Gennady said. It's unclear uh, that we, we, we will not be able to, uh, by 21st century medical standards, be able to, uh, um, if, if we will truly be able to live beyond 125 uh, years. And so it makes sense uh, to focus on that well-span emphasis uh, that he mentioned. I would also say that um, um, about 2 billion of the world's people do not have access uh, to potable water. Uh, or an, a sufficient food. And actually only about 15% of the world's people uh, have access uh, to uh, something like universal health care, um, even by uh, 20th century standards. Uh, so that's, um, uh, so building a public health service in all of our respective countries and finding ways to see that that public health service uh, uh, can ultimately uh, be, uh, be retrofitted uh, to serve the needs of a longer lifespan. Uh, this is a, a part of the equation. Um, uh, Aubrey de Grey is, is uh, fond recently of saying uh, that um, he has the researchers, the research muscle. Um, he has the organizational muscle in the form of, of business interests, uh, but not the organizational muscle in, form, in the form of other institutions, uh, political or cultural institutions. That is a very, very big part of, of that pie. And we need to find ways uh, to uh, to uh, grow that uh, grow that share of ours. Yeah, j just imagine all these specific diseases that could be treated by just tackling aging, but instead, like you know, just billions of dollars is targeting specific diseases instead, <laughs> and a lot of it's being wasted. So yeah. that's that's really uh, that's a really good point, Ben. Um, yeah, if I can go next, uh, so. Uh, life extension, um, you know, you can increase average lifespan, you increase maximum lifespan. 
um, doctors have been trying to increase average lifespan and they've been doing a pretty good job. You know, we've kind of doubled it um, in the last like 100 years, right? Yeah, I think it was like around 40 years old, um, the last 100 years ago, just the average, right? Now it's like 80 around there. Um, and uh, depending if you're thinking globally or just the US, it's a little different, but not much different. But we've actually been increasing morbidity quite a bit. Um, so that's too bad. And so what we're working on, we're trying to increase health span and lifespan. Um, and not just average lifespan, I think it's super important to emphasize increasing maximum lifespan, which is a, a you know, statistical measurement. Um, and which, you know, if you look at the life extension studies, a lot of them don't measure maximum lifespan, which is really weird, you know, because uh, it's pretty important. Um, but, you know, I, they, I guess a lot of researchers don't think so yet, because they only measure average lifespan. Well, the problem with that is, you know, you can just look at the, um, the kaplan Mara curve, right? If you, if you see average lifespan increase by a lot, but then maximum lifespans barely increase or sometimes decrease, it's like, dude, I don't want to take that treatment if it's increasing my health just for a little bit, but then it's, it's killing me sooner. That's pretty important. So hopefully that changes in literature. But yeah, everyone, you know, to our viewers, this is real science. And if you haven't figured it out yet, I mean, it's pretty popular already, but um, the science is developing and it's developing very fast. And, um, you know, we, we need more help and we need more uh, people passionate in defeating death. Um, and yeah, I feel pretty confident that we will defeat all death um, over the next, like, you know, two to three decades. Uh, I'm not sure if that's controversial to everyone in here or not. Uh, I'm sure everybody has their own ideas of uh, when old death would be defeated. You know, we're kind of, in this conversation, we're focusing on biological death. Um, but, you know, there's more, you know, you got self-driving cars, that's going to defeat a lot of death. You get the climate crisis, that's pretty important to, to defeat. Um, yeah, but so we're trying to live for thousands of years. Um, I'm not sure if some people in here are only trying to live for 150 or 200. I'm pretty sure we all want to live to a couple thousand, uh, millions, billions, you know, who knows how long the universe is going to live for. So, yeah. Pushing up to that, um, uh, pushing up to that 120 years uh, globally, I I want to I want to agree with what you said there, Bobby, and throw out another statistic. Uh, right now, the in the lowest uh, 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 range of the developing world, uh, the average life expectancy is is 61 years, and just since the advent of the network world three decades ago, uh, that those numbers have come up significantly by I think about 15 years in some cases, and so we can expect to see. Um, uh, moving into this um, uh, centenarian and super centenarian uh, range on on a, on a global scale, it's this uh, the time frame for these things. I do agree with you is collapsing, and uh, but uh, a lot of that is uh, uh, to do uh, not only with uh, the good research uh, that we do, like folks in this room, but also uh, how uh, our civilization uh, sees that these things are best utilized, and um, and uh, in many cases they're. They're woefully underutilized. Yes, indeed. And I will point out, I hope humankind views this COVID-19 situation as a reason to really ramp up the research to reverse biological aging, given that biological aging is the primary risk factor for complications and death from COVID-19. Young, healthy people with no underlying conditions tend not to suffer severely from this disease. People who are elderly or people who have other morbidities are at great risk from this disease. So if we cure those underlying conditions, then COVID-19 wouldn't be as much of a risk nearly. Yeah, I think the CEO of Twitter uh, vowed recently to uh, to spend a billion dollars uh, uh, fighting COVID-19. You know, governments are spending billions of dollars uh, combined, like just billions upon billions, right? And like, they are just totally missing what we're talking about. And it's really horrible. Uh, it's actually really difficult to smile at um, now that I think about it. But so hopefully that, that uh, people, uh, that gets resolved, you know, that's just a complete waste of money. And uh so hopefully it, it, they, you know, at least give us a piece of the pie. Like, come on now. Like, this is ridiculous. Mm. Yeah, I had a couple yeah, Bobby, what was your... When you have someone in your family who uh, dies from COVID currently, uh, you don't necessarily want to think about uh, other aspects. Uh, but uh, it's true that, in fact, at the same time, uh, there are many more grandpas and grandmas who are dying currently from aging than from COVID. Uh, so, uh, and not only grandpas and grandmas, it depends on what we define uh, 
in aging, but even I mean parents. So, uh, uh, so the, it's a tragedy, tragedy every day. Yes. Absolutely, uh, Steele. Do you have any thoughts on this that you could express in a minute and a half? I don't think I can do anything longer than a minute and a half. Um, so the original question was uh, the definition of longevity. Yeah, Bobby. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, life extension. So my definition, uh, yeah, yeah my, my definition of longevity is pretty simple. You just got to think about it from pretty much all the aspects. There's micro, macro, and everything in between. Micro is biology. Micro is us and, and the ecology of the earth. And we want to extend that to what the chairman, uh, Gennady Stolarov, says as open-ended duration. And I like that definition the most because... Uh, because it allows for the libertarian aspect of, of sovereignty. It allows for you, you can choose how long you want to live for. I would like a world where if you, if you wanted to live 100 years, uh, that's fine with you. If you wanted to live a billion years or anywhere in between, I don't think any of these arguments of 150 years or 80 years or 1,000 years or 10,000 or a billion are, are completely relevant because uh, – because, uh, uh, you, you know, because like once you hit a certain, a certain tipping point, uh, it becomes open-ended anyway. So I think it, then it becomes up to the individual, the individual actor to choose their own lifespan. But also if you're talking about longevity, you're also talking about the longevity of ecology. You're also like, you're talking about the longevity of the species. You don't want the species to fade out like, uh, like an ant's nest or something like that, or a soci sociological uh, phenomenon where it over in over engorges on its own resources and fades out of existence. So for me, longevity is micro, it's macro, it's everything in between that, and it's the parameters and principles that you layer up in between those over embodied with individual sovereignty of what you yourself would like and what the extension of every group around you would like. That's from yourself to the family unit, to the local community, to the state, to the federal government, to the, to the world government, and to eventually to a, a government of Earth and Mars and a collection of forums all the way up to galactic governance. To make it simple, I, um, I have been uh, at the board of the International Longevity Alliance uh, since 2012. So that's a, a community of people who would like uh, to have uh, people live longer and healthier. Um, and I have been also very much involved in uh, Longevity, which is another uh, community with the same uh, ideals. Uh, and also before Metuzela forums, so I think Benzion, you were uh, quite active there. Um, and so, I, well, I'm part of this field too. Um, and, um, and so that was for the short presentation. Uh, for those who are in the US, I graduated from UCLA, so I have various contacts there. And that's where really I was, uh, uh, well, I was already very interested in, in, in life extension, but that's where really I was taught about it. And I worked with the nematodes, I made them live longer. Uh, I later made a mouse lifespan tests. Uh, and of course, human lifespan tests will take a lot more time. Uh, and so this is why we need to rely on biomarkers to see if uh, um, 70 is the new 50 and then 90 is the new 50, etc. Um, so I think um, Alejandro um, didn't uh, uh, introduce himself oh. yet. Sure. Well, my name is Alejandro de la Parra Solom. I'm from Mexico, Mexico City. That's where I'm uh, based at the moment. And uh, yeah, I'm part of, uh, I guess, the longevity community. I've been part of it, uh, I guess, about five years ago. And, uh, you know, I started... Uh, uh, getting into this uh, topic, of course, learning from uh, the grays of uh, Dr. Rob the Gray. And, uh, you know, I'm very fond of what uh, Nicola Danilov is also doing. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful. Uh, so I've been, uh, you know, I guess getting to know how things uh, work. Uh, it happened to... Uh, had some time there with uh, by Viva, Liz Pirish, and uh, Abby Roy. And at some point, uh, we ended up uh, uh, doing a nonprofit uh, entity in Mexico to be able to push these things forward in a more, uh, I guess, economic and, uh, you know, having more throttle there. 
and then I jumped into the regenerative medicine uh, scene from the, uh, I guess, gene therapy thing to the regenerative uh, scene with uh, BioQuark, uh, with uh, Ira Pastor, and then ended up having this clinical initiative addressing things uh, with uh, uh, Regenerate, which would be the clinical side of, of uh, the R&D uh, from BioQuark with BioQuantin. So in the end, I ended up joining in with the World Academy of Medical Sciences uh, through Professor Mark uh, Karendis. And uh, we've been uh, very much enthused, again, with having this mainstream medical science mixed uh, with the innovation and, of course, with the longevity scene. Uh, I've seen so much uh, potential. And I guess uh, my own definition, uh, going back to the question where uh, you were asking about uh, you know, life extension, what's, what's, what's in it uh, for me, I guess I see one of the most things, one of the most compelling things that I've, I've come to understand is that uh, uh, intelligence and specifically I guess human, uh, humans and, and the empathy, the, the capacity to do so many great things and also so horrible things, uh, you know, it ends up being like, why should we waste all this potential? I've discovered that the potential in the people is, is, is something that needs to be, uh, you know, protected. And, uh, you know, I, I believe that we're all confined to the second law of thermodynamics. So it's, it's kind of entropic, everything. So I believe that uh, if we can jump, if we can conquer our biology, and then go ahead and move to uh, perhaps another substrate, such as a uh, you know AI that kind of stuff, mind uploading. We might be able to perhaps not only reach uh, the end of uh, our galaxy or where, you know the, the 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 horizon, but also perhaps ex escape this second law of thermodynamics. And it's all about uh, this potential. I believe that transhumanists, uh, from my very deep uh, sense. Uh, have this 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 awareness of the potential of what can be. You know, Viktor Frankl uh, someday was 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 saying, uh, if you look at a man, uh, what he went up looking at him down. But if you end up understanding what he could be, then you start uh, giving some uh, throttle to to all that. So, yeah. then, uh, mainstream medical science and innovation come forward and 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 push this out of the fringe scenario because many of these things are already happening it's not something in 100 years from now yeah we're gonna have to uh, I'm, I'm, can i can i just ask you have you ever met pavel elin the party secretary of the united states transhumanist party i have not I, I would recommend you meet him because your your values and his values are very very similarly aligned and you would have a great conversation I'd be glad to of course be my owner Thank you, Steve. To, uh, to get around the second law, we're going to have to develop synthetic physics. Um, so, I hope that out. <laughs> um, but so Edward, uh, it's probably a good time now to kind of dive more into the details of lifeexcel.com, uh, life-excel.com. And, uh, and so, yeah, can you discuss like the past, present, and uh, future of the company? Great. Yeah, let's, uh, it's a good time to kind of you know, start diving into more of the details. Um, and you know, have have everybody kind of give their own uh, uh, feedback to you and what they think of your company and um, yes. you know, you guys, okay. You guys can like. uh, so about the past and the future, I will be quick. Uh, I just uh, I'm taking uh, something specific. Uh, so you may have heard about the major mouse testing program, uh, Alejandro. You were organizing the website for it, uh, so it was um, testing many things in mice. So this is the major human testing program, testing many things in humans. Um, and so we have a lot of things to test. Um, and so if you go to the website, you can make a proposal. So let's see, for example, uh, who wants to make a proposal? What would you test on a lifespan? Or oh, I mean, or on aging. Uh, for example, nicotinamide, right? Auntie, are you here? Wait, so you, you're asking, uh, what, what would we propose to test for aging? Yes, I'm just making an example, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, you know, Dr. George Church is doing, uh, I, I think he's doing some great innovation. Uh, he's combining multiple of the gene therapies, you know, the different life extension gene therapies. Yes, but today, let's say today you are at home and you would like to test something. 
uh, you called your medical doctor, or you exchanged with him, and uh, you say, well, I would perhaps like to the metformin, the metformin uh, thing would be great. I mean, you, you also need okay. to have metformin. So, metformin, so um, I, will delete, I will delete this from the website because it's better to have something well prepared. But some gram of metformin per day uh, taken during lunch, for example, I don't know. Um, so that's what you want to do uh, during uh, one week or two weeks or, or one month, one month. And you want to uh, test before uh, some physiological parameters and after also. Uh, so for example, you may want to test arterial stiffness. So you know, uh, uh, the most uh, common way to, to, to suffer from aging and die is cardiovascular issues. Um, we are strongly rel reliant on our arteries uh, and so a, a very uh, basic measure, a physiologic measure of uh, the good health of our arteries is arterial stiffness. Um, yeah. Um, so maybe also you want to see inflammation, so the sharp inflammation. So you will typically measure uh, something called CRP in the blood um, because that's uh, inflammaging. So inflammation is a big component of aging. And I don't know, you will want to see, this is trendy and for good reasons, uh, the Horvath uh, clock. So that's... Uh, um, and that's uh, epigenetics, so the dust or the rust of your on your DNA. And you want to see if all this improves. Uh, and so I will call it uh, metformin. One month. Okay. And so uh, you say this is. Uh, I call it repurposed medicines because uh, metformin is supposedly uh, uh, prescribed for uh, uh, for for diabetes, um, and you suggest. Uh, so of course, when you do this, it's better to do it well, and uh, you can contact us. Our email is pretty much everywhere on the website, and you can contact me or Harold, um, and we can refine it with you. And then it appears on a specific place. Uh, here you have the interventions proposed by visitors. Uh, so you have uh, one of them who proposed interventions against uh, uh, COVID. And here you can say, okay, I'm interested in this. I, I would like to do it. I choose this. Okay. Uh, so now, now that I have chosen this, uh, you will simply see that uh, you have prepared, you have uh, registered for it. And we at LifeXL will prepare it uh, because we need to sort things and make sure they are not so stupid, not dangerous, or uh, if they are dangerous, at least to list the potential side effects. Uh, and we need to prepare the questionnaire. Everything is uh, behind the website prepared, but we need to assemble them correctly uh, for the intervention. Um, and so the goal is that you are not the only one to do the intervention. Anyone can see this intervention and can join as well. Um, uh, so when you do an intervention, uh, there are different things. Uh, it's better uh, if, uh, but you don't have to because we, made, we make some things free and some things uh, pay, people have to pay. For now, what I have described is totally free. So you can totally uh, share your, uh, uh, personal experience uh, um, freely, uh, but sometimes things will take us additional time. For example, if you want uh, to, uh, that people are sure that you're a real person and not uh, doing marketing for pharma and being a, a fake user or whatever, um, then uh, uh, you can ask for it and you, ask, you can ask for people who do the intervention to, to be forced to do it. Uh, then we we'll take some fee for it just because we will call you and ask you questions and uh, well and validate you um, and also uh, you can uh, buy things but we sell them at exactly the price that you see anywhere so we are free otherwise uh, i mean to you it's as if you were free so for example uh, if you take uh, 
we say the arterial stiffness. Um, so uh, uh, we we looked uh, on the web. So usually arterial stiffness is measured with a medical doctor. It's not very complex necessarily, uh, but we found a tool uh, that you put on your finger and that you can reuse as much as you want uh, to measure arterial stiffness at any time, and you can share it with your with your family. Uh, so there is a price. This is the price that you can see anywhere on the web. And our way to make money is simply to uh, uh, take fees because we we uh, we negotiate with them mass contracts. But so for you, it's exactly the same price. And even if there are uh, promotions, you can check this. You will receive an email when there is a promotion. So uh, uh, yes. So it's the same price as if you were buying there. You still have the the the, the possibility to log in there when you receive the the, uh, the materials or the results. Uh, you are aware of promotions. You have everything as if you had bought it on the original website. But in addition, the data is in this website, so that we can make statistics with uh, everyone's experience on uh, different interventions. So I'm not sure if this was clear. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, biomarkers, and uh, Harold is uh, is uh, working on having a lot more uh, uh, biomarkers every day, calling different uh, uh, companies to see what's what's better for us, and we then make a, a selection based uh, on uh, whether it's cheap, because our goal is not to make things uh, expensive, uh, whether uh, it's uh, really a good biomarker. Uh, so typically, arterial stiffness is certainly a very good biomarker, if you ask a physiologist. Um, and then uh, DNA methylation, as you probably all know here, is a good biomarker. Uh, so you have different kinds of uh, clocks uh, of your biological age based on the methylation of your DNA. Um, and uh, typically, it's not here, but we will soon have a, a glycation measure uh, and we have also, I don't know where it is, but we have uh, an inflammation uh, marker. Uh, some of these markers, you can have them when you have a, a blood sample, and that's perfectly fine. We don't ask people to buy anything. You can go to your uh, to your to a place to have your blood uh, sampled, and uh, and you can report manually um, the results in questionnaires here. Um, so this is for the biomarkers. Um, and uh, so this is very important because if you take a treatment but you, you don't test, in fact, how do we know if it works? And so the goal of this website, as we said, is uh, to see what works. Uh, because uh, I have seen, for example, on uh, longevity, but also elsewhere, people uh, taking drugs um, or herbs or, or doing physical activity for now maybe 20 years um, and not reporting correctly. Um, and in the end, we don't know if it works or not. It's purely uh, discussions, but uh, no science Jeez. or not strong uh, science. Yeah, so uh, just to kind of uh, see th uh, if I understood this right. So any one of us can just type in our information and, um, you know, whether we're sick or not. And yes. we can start taking our biomarkers to see what our health really is. Because, I mean, technically, we don't really know what our health is. Um, exactly. And so you'd be able to analyze that for us. And so, exactly. so this isn't just for sick people. Like you, you even want like children to be on here. You want like okay. everyone. Everyone. Excellent. Yes. That's amazing. Because you know, you're as, as when even when you are five, you start to have a, a small plagues in your arteries, and so it grows as you age. Uh, but you do have uh, a strong health parameter, which is arterial arterial stiffness, typically. Um, and you may don't feel it because you don't have a pain markers, pain uh, uh, yes, uh, elements in, in, in your arteries. Yeah. Uh, but in fact, uh, you, you are not necessarily uh, in the health that you believe you are in. Uh, yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. Um, you know, we can be, uh, at Life Excel. you can be, you know, taking people's telomeres, you know, because people, the people telomeres so uh, decrease faster than other people's, you know. So, you know, as a child, you want your, everyone's telomeres to be measured. Because by the time yes. you're 30, you might have eight-year-old telomeres, you know, um, or maybe, totally. high, you know, whatever, you know, you, you want to get your, uh, you, you want to check how much senescence you have, you know, how many uh, totally. senescence cells you have. You want to you check how fast your stem cells are decreasing, you know, like, 
like you know this is like such a perfect company like uh, exactly so that's everything that we are uh, uh people who are who we are contacting right now uh so actually here around you i'm sure many of you know people who do such tests so don't hesitate to have them contact us because we are contacting them at the same time but it's it will go faster um and um yes totally uh totally and so again we will make it the same price as what you have it uh, have elsewhere otherwise you will not go to the website in any case um, so it's the same price and in addition when you go here uh, the data will be incorporated so that what you do for you also uh, has a value for the world for humanity um, and we will make statistics for free so uh, we organize the experiments for free we do the statistics we do a lot of things for free um, it's not necessarily a giant business in terms of uh, business uh, because we take uh, uh, parts of the cost of things uh, by uh, negotiating contracts. Um, but for the, the end user, it's as if it's uh, totally free. Uh, and so we hope to be uh, big uh, for at least in, in size uh, for life extension to occur. Um, um, and healthy life extension, as, as we said. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Janati and Ben and Steele and I'm sure everyone, uh, I'm sure they've all heard of Human Longevity Incorporation and they all highly support them, I'm sure. Uh, and so, yeah, I'd really like, like to hear your guys' opinion on Life Excel. Uh, does this sound just like so innovative and like, I mean, it's demonetized too. Like, look how expensive HLI is compared to this, you know? Yeah, so this uh, is yeah. very interesting because it integrates aspects of personalized medicine with statistical data gathering. So in the age of so-called big data, when we increasingly have more and more information about the fine details of human activity, we still need ways to make sense of that information. And right now we are at the stage where humankind is essentially trying to find needles in haystacks. People are tracking their physical exercise more, they're tracking their dietary intake more, they're tracking their sleep, but how does it all translate into health? How does it translate into longevity? And Life Excel is endeavoring to answer those questions more systematically and allow all of this personalized data to essentially be used in a manner analogous to control trials with some uh, scientific rigor associated with them. Yes. So just to give an example, uh, I was in insurance for a long time because I wanted to look for secrets of longevity through the insurance data. Uh, and the trouble is that uh, the most of the data we, we had was uh, proxies of how, how rich you are. And so the richer, the better. OK, the younger, the better. OK. Uh, in terms of mortality rate, for example, uh, but really that that's not really important information. Um, and when you look at then healthcare data, the trouble, as I said, is that when you are sick, you take a drug, and so you have a huge bias, and it's it's impossible, or virtually impossible, to to see the effect of, of the drugs. Uh, so and and you don't have people taking uh, uh, a lot of things that are uh, very uh, basic i mean you you need this data here um, and so i have spent uh, many years on uh, existing databases but i didn't have the right data uh, uh, it's just like a clinical trial when you do a clinical trial you decide what people do um, yeah so here uh, we are not allowed i am not allowed uh, life excel to decide people to take medical treatments or medical devices because that's uh, uh, that should be done by a medical doctor following a consultation. Um, it could be done online, but uh, I'm not allowed myself. So we, Edward, we, you said you were you were in insurance. Yes, I worked in insurance. I was Mr. Big Data. I, uh, um, I, before, I've been thinking more about life insurance, uh, and you know, because I was I wanted to sign up to Chronix or something, and so I was thinking like, like dang, like life extensionists are the perfect life insurance, um, you know, customers because you know totally. we might not die so we won't have to get you don't have to you know pay out uh so, to, to us i have so a I was thinking like why don't we start a life insurance company and 
and only only um, take people in who are taking life extension treatments. And then, so, like, Bobby, insurance is hyper-regulated. I happen to know quite a bit about this, so it is extremely difficult to start an insurance company because you yeah. need literally millions of dollars in capital oh, yeah. and a lot of compliance overhead, yeah. and you might be regulated by people like me. Uh, so uh, it is, I think, worthwhile to think about this realm, but... Yeah. Uh, in terms of actually starting an insurance company, it's probably an easier job to persuade existing insurance companies to yeah. uh, change their approach here and there. Because uh, one observation that I have, and I'm by no means an expert in life insurance, my expertise is in property and casualty insurance, but my understanding is a lot of life insurers have very generic approaches toward uh, risk of mortality within the population because they rely on the law of large numbers. And for the law of large numbers to work, you need large numbers. You need hundreds of thousands of data points within the population. So they look at fairly basic information like age or do you smoke or do you not smoke? Do you engage in very risky activities like hang gliding, uh, or uh, parachuting, uh, those kinds of questions are those that life insurers consider. And they create these mortality tables based on many years of experience. Sometimes they'll have mortality tables for a particular year, and they'll keep using those tables for many years to come. So in the United States, sometimes you'll still have life insurance products priced based on mortality tables from the early 2000s or beforehand. And that's because life insurers want to be conservative. So they want to build in a certain implicit margin into their pricing. And if the life expectancy before was lower, they're okay with using that older mortality table because they get to charge higher premiums. Now, it is very difficult at present for life insurers to get this kind of granular data about a particular health habit that an individual has. And this is where a service like Life Excel could provide some value in making that data more available, making the findings better known. Uh, now, I'm not suggesting necessarily sell the data to life insurers. Uh, what, I am, what I am saying is if the life insurance industry takes notice of this effort, they might initiate their own studies and they might look into these questions to a greater extent. And as a result, people who engage in healthier habits might get certain discounts that they wouldn't have been eligible for otherwise. There is a company that I uh, met the founder of called Health IQ. And Health IQ is a startup, it's called an insure tech startup in the United States. And there are a lot of these insure tech companies. And Health IQ's business model is to identify individuals who have exceptional habits of fitness. Uh, for instance, long distance runners, uh, people who have uh, certain metrics uh, in uh, various medical tests. And they would give these people discounts, like up to 40% discounts based on my recollection. So that's a promising approach where life insurers might start to seek out these healthier individuals and try to give them lower premiums. But this field is still very much in its infancy and insurers are very conservative when it comes to data. So they're going to need a lot of data from large segments of the population sure. to be able to make these decisions. And hopefully over time, nice. uh, the movement will be in that direction of being able to get that data. So I'd that like to, is my insight. <clears throat> after, I'd like to put uh, this question you to you all. Um, uh, just, just 48 hours ago, the United States Surgeon General uh, said that we are in a Pearl Harbor moment uh, because of this um, a public health crisis on the world, on the world stage. And um, while I think that uh, pursuing inroads to market solutions of the kinds that are being described here 
are always going to be worthwhile. We are at a unique moment in history. Uh, just uh, just uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, Gennady, myself, and a friend of LifeXL, Paul Spiegel, uh, were on a call uh, discussing how uh, this, this uh, unique moment in history uh, could lead to uh, life extension initiatives, uh, particularly uh, in, the, in the public sector or public-private initiatives, and particular to perhaps smaller places adapting uh, their public health services to something that is more life extension oriented. I'd like to have a better idea of what kinds of initiatives they're in. Uh, earlier in this call, Edward and Bobby were discussing uh, human trials and scaling up those trials, effectively uh, how to have uh, you leverage network effects uh, in this kind of instance. I think that we can be doing this um, in a lot of ways in, in public health service. And also equally importantly, uh, to my mind, is inspiring a public confidence in life extension uh, by uh, having some kind of uh, optics where, uh, where people see life extension as something that has, now has a national mandate, even in a very small place. Um, yeah. would, would anyone like to speak to um, uh, this, uh, uh, this idea of a public health service that treats aging as a disease or proposals along these lines? Yeah, I mean, that's what the first part of this video was about with um, that Edward was really focusing on uh, was, you know, he noticed mm -hmm. that COVID-19 has a very adversarial effect to people who are uh, biologically aged. And so uh, we really wanted to let everyone know, like, look, you know, this is a popular uh, virus right now and, you know, tens of thousands of people are being diagnosed. So it's like, sign up to Life Excel, uh, life-excel.com so that we can uh, you know, we can really help you out with this instead of, you know, instead of having to wait like so long for the FDA process and, you know, for our politicians to stop arguing with each other. It's like, dude, like, you know, we're not messing around here. You know, we're, we're, we're not, you know, like Nancy Pelosi, you know, yelling at Trump trying to prevent, you know, like funding and stuff, whatever. Like we don't mess around like that. Like we're trying to live longer. And so, so we're very serious people. So, you know, sign up to Life Excel, uh, And, you know, that's really important. So, so Edward, uh, are, are there some thoughts you would like to share uh, that you would absolutely want to be heard here? Yes. So, one, if you know someone with COVID today, it is great if he comes. Uh, so he just goes to Life Excel. Uh, he'll just scroll down one page and see how to do it. Uh, he will have a formula like this. It looks horrible, but it's quick to, to fill, for example. Have you been tested for COVID-19? If yes, I, 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 one day I do this. Have you have, uh, had symptoms? For example, yes, not able to drink. Um, did you take treatments? That's very important. So for example, yes, I took propamycin. Just to give a, uh, and you, you put the dose. Um, and just this you save, um, along with a few more questions, because uh, we need to and disentangle things. Uh, and so uh, the more people who have COVID, they can do this and we will have a view of which treatments work. Uh, so you, of course, you could say instead of propamycin, for example, uh, well, whatever treatment against uh, COVID potential. Um, so that's one, COVID. Uh, second, uh, I will make uh, small things. Um, um, uh, strawberries. So if you may think, why strawberries? That's not great. Uh, we looked for synthetic drugs. Uh, and uh, as I was saying, we cannot tell people just take a drug. You, you need to be a medical doctor. And it's certainly very important. So we looked at synthetic food. And there are three main ingredients that are very synthetic. There are strawberries, capers, and long pepper. Uh, and we looked at the literature and clearly there is very good evidence that uh, strawberries are very good at high amounts, so typically one kilogram per day. Uh, so that's too much. Uh, so we made a, a, I prepared this strawberry powder. It's a uh, freeze dried. Um, and uh, so it takes a lot less space. And uh, strawberries, I believe, are very good. Uh, so uh, mice, for example, who took fisetin, which is the main uh, synolytic ingredient, uh, when they were old, uh, their remaining lifespan was extended by 60%. You don't see this even with rapamycin. Uh, so I do believe that strawberries are really good. Uh, it's not just like apples or bananas. It's really uh, specific. 
Uh, so we have a, a sort of trial with strawberries and peaches, which are believed to be good too, based on the literature, even though we don't exactly know uh, the, the chemical details for that. Um, and so you either start with strawberries or uh, peaches. I would like to say this because I think this is the beginning of uh, life extension for all. Uh, you don't usually take the necessary, the good dose of uh, peaches or strawberries uh, uh, to have the, the effects. Uh, so it's really something specific um, and uh, we will measure it. And so if you want to do something uh, that is considered not dangerous because it's fruits, fruits, you should do this, I think, and it's uh, uh, likely based on the existing literature to have a much stronger effect than any other nutrient. Um, yeah. yeah, so I would like to say this. Um, and That's we will really soon have, but not now, uh, something to bike under your, your last desktop. Uh, you know, we went through a lot of products be, before uh, choosing which one we will, uh, we will present because we don't want to have a long list of things. Otherwise, uh, it's not useful. We want to really select them. Uh, and so this, this, I think, is uh, useful. We are testing it right now. And it gives you motivation to bike in order to have your computer uh, up and ru running. Um, and uh, we have another one where that uh, we believe, so we have exchanged this with a, a great board. Uh, we have a, uh, where, where's the board? Here. Uh, so you will see the board is quite impressive. Uh, we have Aubrey de Grey, you certainly know him. Brian Kennedy, you certainly know him, former head of the Buck Institute. Uh, Josh Micheldorf, you certainly know him. He's uh, doing uh, things that are very much aligned with Life Excel. Uh, Paul Spiegel, uh, you've just talked about him. Uh, James Q. Watson, a medical doctor who is also a biologist. Uh, and uh, Nikolai Khrushchev, who is uh, also a life extensionist in the pharmaceutical uh, development world. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to say that uh, uh, I believe that if we are able to uh, have the communities come, this could be the life extension for real now. Uh, and even perhaps before the end of COVID, I hope, uh, if people start to take, uh, for example, these uh, strawberry powder, uh, we may have uh, effects seen quite rapidly. Yeah, yeah, this is really great. Um, yes. What do you say, Jedi? Thank you, Edouard, for this overview of Life Excel. We hope that a lot of our viewers will check out the site and participate in the data collection and the experiments and avail themselves of the products you have to offer. Yeah, just so real quick, I wanted to say um, this, there, you can, not only you can give your human data, you know, uh, but you can also like, for example, I have about uh, around 50 acres of farmland right now, and I'm about to start begin my experiments on plants and animals. I want to collect a massive amount of animal data, and so what Edward's doing is much more important. Though, you know, we, you know, mice aren't humans. You know, everybody knows uh, dogs are not humans, and so it's really important that what Life-Excel.com is doing because they are going to have human data, right? And we're going to be able to, to apply neural nets to this data. And so we're going to actually know how the drugs work on your body. We're not going to have to risk safety by doing animal models. Even. Uh, it's, it's a really beautiful method for human trials. And um, it's, it's, I mean, it's medicine, right? That's it's the future of medicine. But so what, what I'm going to do in the meantime, and just to kind of get views and stuff, my YouTube studio will be terrariums and aquariums in the shape of chairs and the table. And I will be feeding them my you know, trade secrets and patented life extension formulas and different combinations I have. And um, because I've been doing research on this for a while, finding them. And so I'm gonna be testing them on different species of organisms, vertebrates and invertebrates. I'm gonna be testing them on farms, uh, different plants and animals, because uh, there's just so much potential. And so, you know, imagine if we had all this data, you know, spanning from animals, from plants, all the way to humans, and then we apply neural nets, you know, similar to what in silicon medicine is doing. Um, and we find safe memetics, and we find, you know, interesting findings and whatever. Uh, you know, I just feel like that's just going to be such an incredible journey that we're all going to share together. So uh, there starts to be quite a lot of data on animal life extension. Um, yeah. So uh, who here has not heard about uh, the MMTP, Major Mouse Testing Program? I actually donated to it back when it was doing its crowdfunding yes. campaign. So there will be a, a, a very soon, well, maybe I can already announce to you, uh, 
the experiment has started. It's just, that's just a few days ago. It took them a few years to get the adequate authorizations and also uh, to make uh, in vitro experiments to uh, better decide what doses of combinations of uh, synolytics they should use. Yeah, so we are going to make an uh, announcement very soon. Um, so in fact, uh, there is someone in the board, uh, Josh Mitteldorf, uh, with whom I have much, much exchanged and uh, we would like uh, to test, well, here I, I cannot be everywhere at the same time, of course, uh, to test in mice different doses. Um, and so typically, uh, instead of doing group A, group B, you take, for example, a small dose of uh, rapamycin, a bit bigger dose of rapamycin, etc., uh, and you change the dose, for example, per cage. Uh, and so instead of having uh, whether group A lives longer than group B, uh, you have a sort of uh, continuation. And so you can uh, uh, regress uh, y equals f of x. You know, you can regress uh, uh, the optimal, uh, the, the dose response of uh, rapamycin on a life extension, right? Um, uh, so this is the kind of things that can be done in humans and done in, in animals with uh, not only lifespan, but also with uh, the same type of health parameters. Uh, so personally, I do think that uh, animal models are useful for us. Of course, we are not big mice, that's true, but still, I believe that uh, uh, there are a lot of things that, uh, will, uh, that can make uh, us live uh, longer and that can make mice longer uh, that are not uh, uh, the way nature has found us to make us live longer than mice. I'm not sure if I am clear, but there are many ways to make animals live longer, not just one or two. So nature finds uh, some of them, but there are so many more, uh, obviously, when empirically we see that so many things work, uh, that uh, probably uh, when you try something in mice and it works, it's uh, quite unlikely on average that uh, the human uh, body has already invented this. Uh, so um, that, that's my view of the, of the whole, uh, I have been interested in this for 20 years, so uh, it, I have a view, of course. Yeah. So, so just to say, I am personally very interested in that. And even though right now, uh, because it's a humans uh, first, I'm doing a, a life excel for humans. If I can at the same time incorporate uh, animal data and uh, use the same uh, markers on animals, I think that's really great. Because you can do more things in animals than you can in humans. I mean, you don't want to test something dangerous on you. And maybe in animals, uh, you can be a bit more, uh, uh, accept a bit more. Maybe not, because uh, the difficulty is uh, animal activists, and, uh, but I, I respect them. They, they have strong beliefs, uh, and that's great. Um, and, but I, I still believe uh, in people more than, I mean, I, I'm a human, so yeah. 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 And you know, uh, to the animal rights activists, uh, you know, like our treatments are not, um, dangerous, you know, they're really safe. Uh, you know, obviously if you dose them, you know, uh, at a high percentage. Uh, yes, that's true if you talk about what we are going to test in humans. Uh, but yeah. for example, if you want a gene therapy, it's probably better to start with mice than with people directly, uh, you know, just in case. Yes. I also oh. think it's really important to change some of the experimental protocols involving animals. And Bobby, you and I discussed this with Dr. Bill Andrews before, how it's a travesty that at the end of an experiment with mice, if you have any surviving mice, uh, often the default protocol has been to euthanize them. But really the yes. most important data would come after the end of that experimental time window because if you're testing for longevity you want to keep the mice alive for as long as they're going to live in order to see whether these interventions not only correct whatever health conditions these mice might have had but actually extend their yeah. maximum lifespan and that has to do with my uh, my point about maximum life extension like scientists do not want to test maximum life extension when really it's like dude it's just a simple test like and a lot of times they'll let the mice live as long as they do, you know, or until they like, you know, are pretty much dead. Um, and they still just don't make the measurement. It's a simple calculation. And it's like, yeah, man, we really got to start measuring so, maximum life extension. Yeah. So you know, the toxicity centers for mice. Uh, so for example, in the US, there is a, 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 it's not the FDA, but there is a big toxicity center and they make a, a lot of results public. 
And so, for example, they have a result with the methylene blue, uh, where you, they kill the, the mice at the age of two. So there are some good reasons for that. They want to see what's inside. Um, uh, but still, they don't have to kill all the mice. And so you, you do see their uh, survival, which is much better under methylene blue than uh, without methylene blue. Uh, and so you wonder, what if they didn't kill the mice, you know? Um, and the trouble is that the pharma industry uh, wasn't interested in aged persons uh, a few decades ago. And it takes a lot of time to adapt to the change of populations. So I think it will come because now they start to be interested in aged persons. And so they should look at aged animals as well. Yeah. 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 Imagine like once this is mainstream, life, like once life extension is mainstream, imagine how efficient we could be. Like we, we have the infrastructure, right? Like imagine once people start like, oh, we can test maximum lifespan now, like so easily. Yeah. Or we there can is just a mainstreaming effect um, that derives from a similar conversation. A lot of people, activists and uh, researchers in this field, uh, think that uh, life extension for your dog as a service uh, it would be the thing that will popularize life extension for humans. Yes. Um, uh, is that something that would, we would have the time to discuss at any length? I would I'm love to uh, work with, uh, there's someone doing the aging dog project. So giving rapamycin it's to your dog. It's not George Church. Uh, it's uh, no, no. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, the, the it's dog the aging project. Environment, um, yeah. In New York, I think he is, um, or, you know, or nearby. And so, yes, and we, we could put this data. It could be in the, in the same Life Excel uh, website. I mean, uh, it's just a... Uh, uh, yeah, they wanted me to uh, interview them soon. With, uh, ways to measure health in dogs and people, so we, we could uh, totally yeah. have that. Uh, Edward, they, they, uh, they wanted me to interview them soon uh, to discuss the dog aging project. And so uh, when I get that interview, I'll, I'll invite you on. Uh, to Matt talk Kerbaline, I think, the researcher. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's the name. I pulled it up while, when, you, when you asked. Uh, uh, D Daniel Promislaw, Matt Kerbaline, Kate Creeby. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true that when you see your dog uh, eating uh, food to live longer, you want to eat that food too, right? So, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, I think there needs to be a lot more focus on maximum lifespans of animals in general. And I believe to be humane, if an animal survives an experiment, that animal has earned the right to live out its days for however long uh, that life is going to be. I wouldn't even be averse personally to releasing these experimental mice into the wild unless you want to figure out how long they're going to live. But uh, if the experiment is concluded and these mice have had some uh, beneficial genetic modifications, then if the researchers can't support them, why not at least give them a chance out in the wild, but I'm the sort of person who has rescued mice who have gotten into my house and carried them out of the house so that uh, they don't have to uh, lose their lives just because they ended up in the wrong place. So I do think- You start seeing them breed and you see like 30 year old mice everywhere. <laughs> well, the uh, next mole rats uh, are already living to 30 plus, but uh, 30 is just the maximum lifespan observed in naked mole rats. Scientists yeah. really don't, they don't know age. If there's an upper limit to their lifespans because uh, they just haven't studied them for long enough to be able to discern that. And this is where I really think a lot more investigation needs to be done into how long various species live. Some scientists should dedicate themselves to just tracking the longevity of particular species very closely and giving them the optimal environments in which they could live. So these are very humane animal trials. These are animal trials that are good for the animal by definition. Yeah. I wouldn't put them in the wild because if they have a genetic modification, you may have a unwilled uh, side effects, uh, I don't know, resistance to uh, antibiotics or whatever that spread uh, through genetics, uh, just, just in case, but uh, that's a specific case. But uh, yes, uh, killing animals, I was in the lab and I was working with mice and killing the animals after an experiment, that's just totally inhuman. The life expectancy of, of various kinds of rats is, uh, ranges from what, about one to three years? And we've already demonstrated in, in the course of this conversation, and it's well understood from the medical literature, that uh, mice 
are able uh, to live uh, four times their life expectancy, even if you remove some of the things that are a little more involved, if we're talking about pets, uh, the, you could uh, still already be demonstrating a, a pet uh, that uh, lives uh, a preternaturally long uh, a time by the standards of the pet owners, um, I, I should think. And that's, uh, that's the most, if there's a takeaway in this conversation, I would imagine that might be one of them, uh, that, um, uh, that uh, people could have pets uh, that, that live a lot longer than the, the pets that they already have. Um, yeah. The idea of what is the thing that sparks um, a, a fervent public interest in life extension is uh, uh, I, I, in, no, in no sense a settled question, I think, in any of our minds. <laughs> uh, but uh, this, this is regarded as on that list. Yes, yeah. and pets, of course, uh, are a population where it will be fairly easy to observe major increases in lifespan. And even now there are major discrepancies in lifespan, say between feral cats, which live on average about two to three years, and house cats, where if you have a completely indoor cat, it's not uncommon for that cat to live to 20 plus years. And indeed the oldest recorded cat lifespan was 39, which suggests that if cats received the same standard of medical care that humans receive, where the priority is always to try to cure them no matter what, no matter how much it costs. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of house cats started to live into their 30s. Again, this is a population where there just hasn't been enough effort made into assuring their longevity. But imagine if those priorities shift and imagine if people perceive the sense of possibility that uh, we can make our beloved pets live a lot longer. And if we can do that to pets, why not to people? I want, I want a hundred year old cat. <laughs> yeah. As do I. At the, top of, at the top of this call, I was looking at uh, some statistics about, uh, about a life extension in different countries. And, um, uh, you know, so there are, are countries uh, that, you know, like Singapore that have a, a, a right-leaning government uh, that have outcomes for life, uh, longer lifespans on par with anything in the world. Um, but the thing that, um, uh, the thing that does separate uh, the countries that have this from the ones that, uh, that do not uh, is uh, political and economic stability and, uh, and some kind of uh, reasonable dis distribution of the income e uh, equality they're in. Um, and um, uh, this is, so to some degree, this question of, uh, of, of spending a, a good deal of money to have uh, a thousand year old cat is an interesting one as, a, as some, as some uh, a political theater on behalf of life extension. Uh, but uh, I, I, I would call back what Edward uh, said, uh, man being the measure of all things is very much in my mind too. And I want, uh, I, I, um, just as I would, uh, uh, I, th I think that perhaps uh, Peter Thiel might be able to uh, have reached longevity escape velocity now, I would ra really rather Peter Thiel and everyone pooled their resources uh, to see that that happened for everyone as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't know how to convince anyone to do that or what that actually looks like. Uh, but um, um, anyway, my, my two cents on the, uh, on the, yeah. on the universal Speaking longevity. of Peter Thiel, I, uh, I was gonna interview his, um, one of the scientists at Ambrosia that company that where he was getting the you know the infusions the parabiosis he was getting okay um, yeah uh and so um and so hopefully i can get a hold of peter thiel himself uh through that um because you know that'd be really great to get him on board with uh, life-excel.com and the transhumanist party because uh, you know he seems to be pretty passionate about um defeating aging also hmm. Now on the subject of parabiosis, I'm a bit of a skeptic of parabiosis because mm -hmm. yeah. it seems what happens when you link an older organism to a younger organism is that the older organism benefits from the a better shape of the younger organism. So the younger yeah. organism uh, yeah. is more intact. Well, the, the, Peter Thiel's not putting his blood inside the kid that they have. Um, <laughs> Right. Uh, they, I think they have, uh, he has like a younger kid, um, like not too young, but uh, yeah, I don't think they're putting Peter's blood in, in the kid. No, no, no. But, yeah, I, uh, I don't. I don't mean to say but, that Peter Thiel uh, is doing anything unethical. It's just yeah. 
in the experiments with mice where they connected the yeah. two mice uh, and their circulatory systems. It's the uh, more robust circulatory system of the younger mouse that supported yeah. the older mouse. So, uh, but it's because uh, they were linked, not because there was blood yeah. from the younger mouse. <laughs> and the kid uh, gets surgically connected to the kid. Uh, so, yeah, you know, the thing, the problem with ambrosia and like, you know, injecting people's younger blood into older people is there's a lot of things in blood, you know, and there's a lot of toxins in blood. Yeah. And we don't really know how healthy people are. Like a kid could look the healthiest any kid looks, you know, you can do every test we have to date on any kid and they could look so healthy, but still look, we really don't know what's happening. And, um, it, you know, we really don't know. So, um, so you don't want to be injecting people's blood into other people for the sake of health. Okay. You want to be extracting what parts of the blood keep evolving. For example, mesenchymal stem cells. You can go to the Panama uh, Stem Cell Institute, get IV uh, mesenchymal stem cells. And then you can give us your biomarkers at life-excel.com. Um, that's a promising life extension treatment. Um, and so, you know, that, that's really the approach you want to take. You know, like what Janani's saying, like you know, there's some problems with injecting blood in the people. Speaking, I mean, uh, speaking yeah. of trying on more speculative uh, uh, biomedical uh, things for size, um, uh, you you know and uh, and have uh, have some insights into the workings of uh, uh, Dr. Sergio Canavero, Bobby. Um, the the uh, a body transplantation um, uh, as, uh, would be surgeon, um, and this is another Imagine one of those biomarkers from somebody uh, Edward who had a head transplant. <laughs> this is another one of those things on the list of things that has piqued public interest uh, to some degree in a life extension discussion, and um, he, uh, it it also is arguably uh, verging on uh, junk science. Uh, but this, uh, this gentleman and others, uh, maybe uh, with uh, uh, more uh, uh, more letters behind their names, uh, have said that uh, for some for some amount of uh, four hundred million dollars, they could demonstrate this um, uh, this process uh, today, um, not perfectly, uh, but um, uh, this uh, this is something that I think should be of interest. Uh, to people uh, uh, trying to uh, 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 bridge the gap uh, between um, um, uh, uh, what? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not too into well, the head. Okay. Of the head. Before, before we go there, Edward has something to show us, and uh, yeah. I know what so, this is, but go ahead and explain it. Uh, uh, so actually, I, I worked in a lab, and I did uh, not only work on, on nematodes, but also mice and rats and people and on nice. uh, the way we age in terms of cardiopulmonary uh, aspects. Uh, and I was doing surgery with surgeons on, the, on, on rats, uh, uh, pulling the heart out of the chest and, uh, and did lots of things. So I, I knew this quite, the field quite well. And when there was all these discussions about young blood, old blood, parabiosis, I went to see uh, everyone uh, by email uh, uh, to, to do an experiment. and. Uh, Everyone was telling me, no, that's too complex. And I ended up in Ukraine with Irina Pichel, who at that time was uh, one of the, like, like the convoys in, in California. She was uh, one of the top ones in the, in the field. And we did an experiment together. So I went there and uh, I contributed quite a lot uh, to uh, inject young blood or plasma of uh, young mice. Uh, uh, quite high quantity actually uh, to um, uh, old mice. Uh, so the people there were extremely trained in terms of manual techniques to do it well. Um, and uh, we did a mouse lifespan tests. And even though uh, there are many uh, short duration good effects, uh, over time, uh, you just see the same lifespan exactly whether uh, you injected saline, so uh, nothing special, or uh, young plasma. So it's a bit strange. And then once this was published, we were contacted by Ambrosis and uh, Alcahest because they didn't want to believe the result, which I understand. Uh, so we said, well, maybe there is something special, but we don't know what. Uh, and we hope it works in humans for Alzheimer's or whatever. But in the mice, we did the best we could. If you go to uh, PubMed, you, you put my name, for example, you, you will see it. So, and before doing this, uh, because I have spent a lot of time with them, they had done a, a lifespan test in parabiosis. 
Uh, so young mice and young mice, uh, young mice and old mice, old mice and old mice, etc. Uh, the trouble is that it's a big intervention, and there are some deaths when the, during the intervention. You know, it's like a COVID. Uh, uh, if you get out of it, it's okay, but during some time you have a sequel. Um, and so it was really not that obvious. Um, in fact, there are the sequels, and then there is something else, which is that the, the two mice, when they are connected to each other, uh, they don't like that. Uh, so you have to make sure that they don't uh, kill themselves just by trying to separate themselves. Um, uh, so it's, it's a difficult experiment to do. So that's why we did this. And I don't think we can do anything better with rats or mice. Uh, so I think the final world, word is probably this one. And Alka has tested a lot of things, and the only way they found uh, to extend lifespan was to inject human umbilical cord uh, blood in aged mice. Which is rather go. strange, actually, Stem because uh, humans yeah, are so different species. Exactly. Uh, so you see, uh, it's, uh, it's, if you have to go that far, it's probably not the effect of young versus old, but yeah. more human versus mouse. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, Xeno sort of, you know, experiments like this, where they inject, you know, human stem cells, or they'll inject human blood, or they'll inject, you know, whatever, something from a human into like a mouse. Um, and there's like incredible health benefits. And you think there'd be some sort of like, you know, uh, uh, immune response you know, it's like, you know, don't, stop putting this other animal into me. But uh, it actually is, has really improved the animals. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's really interesting, this Xeno uh, sort of field. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. sometimes so, humans have received pig organs, for instance, uh, in organ yeah. transplants. And uh, sometimes the immune system has accepted them, which is interesting. It is worthwhile to think about uh, to what extent we are similar enough to other animals to be oh able God. to benefit from research or even parts uh, in this case, or genes with genetic so, editing. Um, so I just kind of thought of something real quick about life-excel.com uh, life and how freaking amazing it's going to be. So, okay, think of all the innovation, right? I mean, it's really just going to super accelerate everything. So think about all the, all the innovation that's occurring, right? Like, for example, Martin Rothblatt, and uh, George Church, they are um, really trying to uh, genetically engineer pigs so that we can uh, put their organs into humans, doing right? And they're getting really close. Uh, and they're doing a really great job, right? And so imagine people who start getting pig organs, right? Or, or 3D bowel printed organs, right? That are human organs. So people, you know, in case they have a problem with pigs being used. Uh, you know, we're going to eventually be able to 3D bowel print. Imagine we're getting their biomarkers, okay? And we can, we can in real time keep, keep, you know, this data going and see these, like, differences and stuff. Like, oh, my God, that'd be so incredible. Well, that will be so incredible to be able to see that and to see you uh, do that, Edward. You know, just, you know, imagine somebody gets this, uh, you know, this, these transplants and then and they're, they're signed up with life-excel.com. Like, imagine that data. Like, that's incredible real time data too like we're not waiting for the fda process whatever like man it's really that's really amazing mm -hmm. let us move toward concluding thoughts from each of us uh, so if there's anything else that any of you wanted to address now is the time anybody want to go first so i would be happy to have advice or tips to have life excel uh uh, work. Um, I'm not a big startupper, I'm more a scientist, uh, and I think we need both here. Uh, so I'm happy to have uh, uh, yeah, tips, help. Well, we really appreciate having you here for this discussion and presenting all of the features that you've already. Uh, placed into Life Excel and the other features that you plan to deploy in the future. Uh, I think this is a very promising platform. Hopefully, a lot of people will contribute their data to it and pursue various experiments that will not only enhance their health, but also enhance the public's knowledge in a systematic way of the effects of a lot of these interventions. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, any, anybody else have concluding thoughts? Uh, well, we, we had discussed a few different uh, um, uh, things of a more speculative uh, nature, of a more controversial nature, and uh, also things that uh, affect um, uh, all manner of, uh, uh, of public relations or, or potential regulatory concerns around, um, around emerging biomedicine. Um, I, I'm inclined to think uh, that uh, we should always be trying uh, to, to get attention uh, for uh, these things, um, so so long as they don't uh, present uh, a literal existential risk. Um, so you mentioned uh, Martin Rothblatt's company, and, um, which is uh, doing a good job of making these uh, pig organs. You can imagine a scenario uh, where uh, where there's some pushback uh, to to these kinds of things. Uh, we, we're not necessarily uh, we maybe we moving past that to some degree, uh, but I think that. If this community is willing uh, to uh, try to uh, raise awareness for things like uh, body transplantation or uh, like um, even some uh, uh, less, less literal life extension uh, stunts and less costly life extension stunts that I've proposed for our organization, uh, if, you're, if you're willing to uh, take that sort of uh, uh, political theater and extreme marketing uh, position, uh, I think uh, we can do an awful lot more to move the needle in the direction of people uh, because people will tend to have fear-based responses, but uh, we don't live in a world of a lot of um, uh, really provincial personalities. We live in a connected world where people are able to uh, evaluate new ideas uh, pretty quickly. And I think that we uh, should capitalize on that by, uh, by using these kinds of uh, pub publicity stunts yeah. to our advantage. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess my concluding thoughts, uh, well, maybe to also respond to Ben is, you know, I, yeah, I feel like a lot of people will be against these kind of uh, like things like, you know, xenotransplantation where you're taking pig organs and stuff. And it's like, okay, well, what can you do to prevent all this animal atrocities uh, occurring, you know? Uh, well, one thing you do is you can support 3D bioprinting. Um, another thing you can do is you can support life.xl.com, right? Because we, we literally are helping scientists transition off of animals science and on a human science you know like you know obviously this is still, still going to be animal testing but we could really decrease that by a lot if we have a massive amount of data from humans because now we have human data we, we can do we're doing the tests on the humans and so so that's really beautiful but uh yeah uh for concluding thoughts um you know i'm just so excited to see uh, life-excel.com uh, progress and there's just so much potential and uh yeah, I really look forward to helping uh, Edward and you know, our species uh, defeat death. Excellent. Steele, do you have any concluding thoughts? Uh, hey, everybody. Yeah, no, I, I don't really have any concluding thoughts. I think everybody added uh, uh, valiantly. Uh, Edward, come on the show and let's talk more about, uh, let's talk more about your processes. But Yes, in, in general, this is fascinating and uplifting animals, uh, you know, general life extension of animals and studies of animals has ethical concerns. And I, I agree with Bobby, I would like a shift, a more of a shift to human observation, uh, human category, you know, human data. I think, I think human data is, is more important for the life extension people. I think society, I think we've got all we need most mostly what we need out of the animals anyway the the, the closest being the primates uh, this the uh, the the monkeys uh, the chimpanzees and those guys so um yeah okay but in general yes we do need to get more human data yeah that, that that brings in a whole bunch of ethical issues and status issues on laws and conventions and human rights and all that but um the best, the most equitable, the, the easiest way to get that data out is, is by getting people to give over that data. And to give over that data, usually you denote that to contract law. Contract law, when people sign away their data in terms of contracts, uh, it's, it's quite easy to do. So, you know, think about it in that respect. Um, fantastic. And... Yeah, and, 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 you know, there's this life-changing uh, societal paradigm shift, which the chairman had uh, announced uh, in one of his, in one of his, uh, there's one of these uh, paradigm shifting 
um, policies in the USDP uh, COVID-19 result, uh, you know, uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, policies that the chairman announced. And that's, you know, kind of like this folded idea, you know, this, this app idea where people innovate and they give away their time, essentially, for the monetary return, which can create a new structural income for people in order to generate solutions. Uh, and, and you can play this idea out on, on a database as well, on, on, data, on data retention and on data um, conservation and data um, harvesting as well. So, um, you know, if, if you want to invent a fun, exciting uh, casino-like uh, uh, way in order to uh, encourage people to give away their medical uh, or, or other data um, on their social or behavioral techniques and, and behaviors, um, sure, then, then do that in exchange for some sort of fiat currency or, or crypto, cryptocurrency or something like that. And I think, I think that's a way you can extract uh, not just a, a small participant where you're talking about volunteers who sign up to something and they get an exchange of ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 return. You're talking about a mass societal change uh, which can impact entire entire nation states who need uh, currency or uh, first world people who need currency as well and this changes the whole paradigm of, of society that's all i have to say thank you very much Did yes I thank you Steele, and thank you everyone for your thoughts thank you edward for your presentation this has been excellent and hopefully we will continue this discussion in other venues and in the meantime live long and prosper